This is Hot Mike. Hot Mike. On the networks of WDAY. WDAY. Here's Dom Izzo. Welcome back, everybody. Hour two of Hot Mike, ready to rock and roll on this Wednesday morning. Getting ready for the Dakota Marker game. Round 21 comes up on Saturday night. Remember, it's 7 o'clock, ESPN2. Don't call the station. It's not on WDAY. You can find ESPN2 a lot easier than ESPN Plus uh, last week. It's our pleasure to welcome back to our show the voice of South Dakota State football and men's basketball. Tyler Merriam joins us. By the way, look at the new digs. After the last couple of years, we thought the roof was going to come down on you. Look at this. This is sweet. It still might. It still might. But in all the construction of First Bank and Trust Arena, we're able to move into it for volleyball. That's been a rousing success. Obviously, they're the only undefeated program left in Division One women's volleyball. And with all of that, we got some new digs and just trying to live up to the lofty standards that you have established for Dakota Media, Dom. Uh, I'm going to be calling the uh, Jacks Bison volleyball match. I want to ask you about that. Is that a total surprise on SDSU volleyball in your mind? Well, I don't think anybody anticipated them being undefeated. I think that would be uh, wrong to suggest, but it's a program that certainly has been on the rise. Dan George Alice has done an excellent job, and they felt like they had a really good team coming in. The other thing, too, they went on a foreign trip this past summer and got a lot of extra time together. And so where so many programs in the Summit League were dealing with transfers and all these new faces and trying to get uh, acclimated with everybody in early August, the Jacks kind of had a head start, and that helped. And they just have so many weapons. I mean, they're using a 6-2 setup with, with two different liberos and two different setters, and it's it's really worked well. They are a fun team to watch. Can't wait. I'm really looking forward to that one coming up uh, tomorrow night. I saw the photos of it. I was there. You gave me a little tour when we were down in Brookings last November. We snuck now, in, yeah, we? Maybe we did. Now it's open. Tell me about the and what the environment was. Just watch a little bit of the first volleyball game, man. It looked like it was electric. No, oh, so much fun. I had the privilege of calling the first one. As you get to call volleyball t- uh, tomorrow, I got to. It was so unique, so much fun. Um, one of the things about Frost the last decade or so was the student section in the lower level was elevated a little bit. Yep. That's no longer the case. And so now the opposing student athletes are looking eye to eye with the student section. So that's a little different here than it's been in the last decade or so. So that's certainly a, a bigger deal. And everything's just tighter. The biggest concern, Dom, when it, we made this decision to renovate the arena was are you going to lose the home court advantage and that sound and with everything now being tighter the noise is even louder Mm. and you get that band right next to the visiting bench i am sure david richmond will love that come (laughs) january it uh it is intense and uh it's cool it really is cool and and uh i'm excited to see basketball in there we've obviously gotten a a neat little uh look at it already with volleyball it's gonna be fun to see wrestling in there too it's gonna be a lot of fun and uh visiting with both basketball coaches last week at summit league media day they are extremely excited about that knowing full well the schedule of the team especially aj what he has coming in there for the women's side that could be electric opening night well, and opening night will be Creighton, who yeah. uh, on one of the preseason polls is ranked already in the top 25, and the, the Jacks won't be too far off. So it's going to be a heck of an opening night for, for basketball. The only weird thing about that is that that opening night is before football at North Dakota the next day. So there'll be some of us that will put on some hours, Dom, <laughs> but uh, it'll be a lot of fun. You? Hours? Never. Come on. Um <laughs> So, Again, following your lead. Yeah, well, come on now. So <laughs> tell me about this Jackrabbit team. I think from afar, and, I, you know, we follow it as close as we try to, that Oklahoma State played out. We, like, Oklahoma State's pretty good. Then the, the game's following. Incarnate Word, they won. The game with Augie, I think, had maybe some fans scratching their heads. Then the bye, and then the, the, the last couple games, or the Southeast Louisiana game, then the bye, and the last two, Tyler. It's like, Okay, these are the Jackrabbits. You've seen them up close. Give me your evaluation of 2024. I think that, uh, again, like you said, the Oklahoma State game, the the Jacks got off to a slow start, dug themselves a hole, and just couldn't get out of it. And Incarnate Word is very good, very athletic. The Jacks made a couple of mistakes early, and that's a, a tie game early in the third quarter. They bust a screen for a touchdown, and since then, the Jacks' defense has been really, really good. It's given up three touchdowns since, and two of those to Youngstown State on Saturday, and one really didn't matter. But defensively, they've been very, very good. 
offensively, it hasn't fully clicked, but it's getting really close. Um, rushing game wise, they're so deep at running back. You know, Amar Johnson, Angel Johnson, Kirby Voorhees had an electric day at Southeastern yeah. Louisiana. Maxwell Woods, of course, is a kid that's very familiar to Bison fans and was originally committed there. And he had a great day against Augustana off the bench. So they're so versatile and deep at running back. Granowski's just been a little bit off in the passing game for whatever reason. It's been good. It hasn't been great. And some of that is because you have such high expectations of a Walter Payton Award winner. So you anticipate every pass will be a 50-yard touchdown. <laughs> and when it isn't, all of a sudden you're almost groaning in disappointment. And so it's not necessarily his fault. But they've been very good. Um, certainly they haven't been tested other than Oklahoma State quite like they will on Saturday. And even that, the level of physicality is different. You know, it was more about speed on the perimeter against Oklahoma State. The level of physical play, as you and I well know, in this game on Saturday will be unlike anything. We thought yeah. you and I would be, and that really wasn't. Yeah. And so this will be this will be a huge test, obviously, on Saturday. The defense, defense Tyler, has been the thing that I look at. Like, boy, I wasn't sure how good they're going to Knowing what they lost, they've been unbelievable. Has that surprised Jackrabbit fans at all, or is this what they expected? I think they expected the defense to be good. You could always argue just how good they've been. I mean, the the three-game stretch there with Southeastern, Augustana, and UNI is the fewest points allowed in a three-game stretch since the early 60s by a Jackrabbit football team, so remarkable in that regard. Again, shuffling a lot of guys in and out up front. The linebacking core has been really, really good, and everybody points to Bach, and that's fair, but Francel, Spalding, McGoy, you know, they've picked up because they lost Freeman. Yep. They lost Stalbert. Freeman was an All-American. Stalbert to the NFL. Really good. And, and they've been able to replace those guys. That safety's been the disappointment because reader has been out and won't return. And then Large has been out the last few weeks. And we'll see if he's able to go on Saturday or not. So you came in with those two. And then Herter, who had the big interception yep. a couple of years ago in Fargo, thinking, man, what a group of three veteran safeties you have. And the Jacks have only had one of them really at a time the entire year. And yet they've been able to get by. Uh, you have to give a nod to Colby Humphrey, too. Humphrey's been so good opposite Beanham. Those two corners have been phenomenal to this point. Even Oklahoma State didn't have the success in the passing game it thought it would. It, it had some plays, but Humphrey and Beanham really did a job. And, and again, we know those corners will be tested by such a, a versatile and deep group of buys and receivers, but that defense has been very sound. I look at the line of SDSU backs, and now Amar Johnson, I thought, had his coming out party against the Bison here a couple years ago. What makes him the next in the line of great SDSU backs in your mind? I think in that game two years ago in the national championship in Frisco as well, you saw his ability to run to daylight, and he's very good at changing direction. What's impressed since is that he's really taken to heart what he learned from Isaiah Davis about how to be more of a physical back. He doesn't have the Davis-level stiff arm yet, but he's added that to his arsenal, and uh, and he's more physical of a running back. That's what's really stood out this year, Dom, because going into the year, the question outside was, okay, if Amar Johnson is the feature back, is he going to be able to be as physical as an Isaiah Davis was? And Again, it's hard to be as physical as Davis was, but can you bring something similar to that? And he really has. He's been very good. Uh, he's been excellent out of the backfield as a receiver on top of things. So he just brings a, a different dimension there that uh, he does some things Davis didn't do quite yeah. as well. you know. And so he's not as physical of a runner, but he's a better receiver. And Davis was good in that game, but Amar's even better in that regard. Uh, I know you can give us the kitchen sink on Chase Mason after what we saw Saturday against Youngstown State. I know how amazing an athlete he is. Was, were they just itching, Ryan Olsen, itching to get him involved in the game like they did Saturday? Well, they've been using him all year in a variety of roles, and that was one of the things coming in. And this program over the last few years – you know, you go back to when they had Goddard and they'd find ways to put four wideouts and Goddard out there. And it was all about how do we get our six best skill position players on the field? And at times it was Davis and Amar Johnson together a year ago as running backs. At times it's been multiple tight ends. In this case, it was, hey, we have such a dynamic playmaker in Mason. We can't just let him sit on the sidelines waiting to see if Mark gets hurt or to take a knee in the fourth quarter. We have to find a way to use him. But again, 
you you don't want Mark to not run the football, so what do you do with him? So they've created some of these things, no doubt watching Montana State and what they did with Malad and mm-hmm. Chambers uh, has helped in some of the design, but they've used Mason split out at wideout. They've used him lining up as a running back. They've had him take the snap with Gronowski on the field next to him or with Gronowski lined up as a wideout. They handed the football off to him as a traditional tailback on Saturday, as yeah. you mentioned, and he runs 39 for a touchdown. And he is deceptively fast. He's big, he's athletic, but when he gets out in the clear, he can really run too. And it's uh, it's quite the dimension. And they again, they're going to get him on the field for whatever it is, 10 plays. I mean, maybe it's not quite that many, but they're going to find a way to get him involved in the offense every week, and they continue to use him in different ways as well. How do they find another monster tight end in Graham Goring? How, did, how They just keep finding him. What about this guy? Well, and Goring's a wide receiver. Goring and Wildy have been the two wideouts. They've got five tight ends they use. And here's the fascinating (laughs) thing, Dom, about the tight ends, is that the five tight ends, you know, we we joked about this with Northern Iowa a couple of weeks ago. They have two tight ends. When they call a two tight end package, the two tight ends play. SDSU has the two tight end package with Gannon and Alpers and the two tight end package with Gormley and Gannon and the two tight end package (laughs) with Brennan and Gormley. So they have, I think it's 39 different packages based upon which tight ends they want on the field. And then let's throw one more wrinkle onto it. There was one snap on Saturday, Dom. They had seven offensive linemen in the game. (laughs) They played six offensive linemen, got to the goal line, and then put another O-lineman in for a wideout and had seven offensive linemen on the field. So they're going to use their bodies. Again, they're going to find a way to do it. The tight end room is long. They don't necessarily have yet that Tucker Craft or that Dallas Goddard or that Zach Hines, but they love the depth of the room. They're going to use that room. And as I said, you watch, they're, uh, they're going to be sending bodies in and out at tight end all game long. You have to have your program handy to know which ones are in the game. <laughs> you, uh, you've you been around this team forever. They're ex- experienced. This is a monster two-game stretch. I, I, I'm interested about how they attack this, knowing they got USD primetime game the week after that in Brookings, and this is a monster one as well. How with a, with a veteran team, you, have, you can't worry about that, right? That they, they're, they're locked in for what's coming Saturday night. Oh, absolutely. There, there's no looking past North yeah. Dakota State if that's what you're getting at, Dom. It's one game at a time. Are they excited to be on national TV again and be at home? Certainly they are, but, I mean, they're excited to play in November at home, too. I mean, there's it's one week at a time, and this is such a pivotal game, one versus two, and, and uh, you know, there's always the, is it easier to be the hunter than the hunted? And we can come up with all these different phrases, and I know from the stories you guys have done about how badly North Dakota State wants that marker back, and certainly, understandably, so but it means a lot to South Dakota State too and and everybody knows what this means I mean it puts you in the driver's seat yes USD is still sitting out there and they're an exceptional football team and as you guys have talked we know Missouri State's going to have a say in this thing and and uh there's it's not a cakewalk the rest of the way but if you win this game you're in the driver's seat for a Valley Championship, for a top two seed. We know what that home field advantage means. NDSU doesn't want to play in Brookings in the snow in December. The Jacks don't want to play in Fargo in December. Nobody else does either, but neither one of those two want to play the other on the road. So they know how much Saturday means, and they'll handle USD next week. They've got to get through this. And and, uh, and again, so many of these guys know each other, too. You've, you've got to remember that, too, Dom. A lot of these guys are recruited by both schools and uh, they know the backstory. They know each other. That matters a lot in this thing, too. We're going to have Danny Freund on the show on Friday. What is his twitch or tweak to the offense? How is that noticeable? Have you seen that this season? I mean, he's had his hands on it. I don't think there's any one thing you look at and go, boy, that's what Danny Freund did. But I know he brings a lot of ideas. I think the thing that's been most impressive is for somebody who called the plays at North Dakota as long as he did, coming into what could be viewed as a lesser role from an outsider's perspective, you don't get the sense of that at all. He is ecstatic to be here. He's fit in great, which if anybody knows him out there, I know you do. He's just such a terrific guy in general off the field, and so he's hard not to like. And then on top of it, he's just floated out some ideas, and he's a great sounding board for Ryan Olsen. You know, Olsen, the offensive coordinator, is an offensive lineman by trade. And and so to have 
different perspectives are good things. They blend well. And, and Olsen says he takes a lot of ideas from Danny. Olsen's the one calling the plays, but those two obviously chat throughout the course of the day. And, and uh, so there isn't one specific thing you look at, but let's not kid ourselves. You can, you can tell, like, there, there's some wrinkles in there, and you know he's got his hands in it. <laughs> Uh, I'm just looking down the road here. The men's basketball is going to, uh, are they going to the Cayman Islands? Are you getting on that trip? I am not because who can pass up Springfield, Missouri, (laughs) Dom? I mean, I looked at my options and I went, hey, how can I not go to Springfield, Missouri when the opportunity awaits itself to, to be there for the last game? in the history of the Missouri Valley Football uh, Conference for the Fighting Bears of Missouri State University was too good to pass you up. You do have a trip to Tuscaloosa, though, later, which I know Bison fans will have uh, their eyes on that. That's really neat that the, that the Jacks are going to play Alabama. And that'll be uh, the third time they've been down there here in the last decade, so it's been interesting. And that is a unique game, too. That's the last non-conference game. That's at the end of December. So, But uh, the men have a very good schedule. They'll play McNeese to open yep. the year in the Sanford Pentagon in Sioux Falls. And McNeese, a team that'll probably get some votes. I don't think they'll be ranked, but they'll certainly get some attention. And and uh, that's another challenging schedule. Long Beach State will be here for the opener. That'll be along with that women's game with Creighton. So it'll be quite the doubleheader to Chris and First Bank and Trust Arena coming up in November. You're the man. Thanks so much for doing this, and uh, can't wait to see you on Saturday. Thanks for the time this morning, okay? Uh, it's always a privilege. Are you going to be able to pull yourself away from the Mets this week to focus on this football <laughs> no. game? I've been concerned. No, no. I mean, between that and the Devontae Adams signing yeah. and everything else, Dom, you know, we're, we're, we're worried about it's you. A bi- it's so a you big know. week. I appreciate that. But uh, tell, me, uh, tell me what the Mets series is on Saturday. Are we up? Or is it o- if it's over, then I know I'm going to be in a good mood then. You know? Well, I can't control those things. I mean, we're just along for the ride, and and uh, and I just hope that uh, that Colpack and McFeely and the crew take it easy on you. Yeah, this yeah no, no, no chance of that. Yeah. Few days. There's no chance of that happening. It's great to see you, bud. I'll see you on Saturday, okay? Sounds good. Take care, my friend. Tyler Merriam, voice of South Dakota State. He does football and men's basketball. Does an amazing job on both. We appreciate his time this morning, as always, from the pretty neat palatial studios he's got. Uh, there it is the new uh, first Western Bank and Trust Arena down there in uh, Brookings. Can't wait. We're gonna hopefully we're gonna get a first uh, glimpse of that come up during basketball season. We've been invited. Not sure if we're gonna go, but we've been invited uh, to come down for that. And you just look at it. And we saw a few clips there from the game against Oklahoma State, the game against Youngstown. We'll have more on this throughout the week. Just again. It, People have to remember, they are still South Dakota State. They still have guys all over the field. Amar Johnson is not an unknown commodity. Gronowski certainly isn't. Bach on defense. Dallas Beanham. They got dudes. They may not be what they were last year, but they're still awfully good. And the Bison are beat up. That's a huge key heading into this game. We'll take our last break. We come back. We'll get you ready. We've got a big Sporting Wednesday on tap. We'll answer our poll question. Bison Media Zone coming up as well here in about 15 minutes. We'll wrap up Hot Mike on this Wednesday right after this.